It's a real pleasure to talk with Laurie Santos. Laurie is a cognitive scientist and a psychologist trained. She teaches at Yale, where she holds the most popular course ever, titled Psychology and Good Life where she shows how psychology can provide important insights on how to make wise choices that allow us to live a happier life. She also has a high listen podcast, The Happiness Lab, which I really recommend to all of you listening. So, Laurie, thank you very much uh, to join me in this um, you know, attempt to understand and steal out a little bit of your uh, science. Okay, if it's okay for you, we would like to ask you know a few questions, and I will start from you know the very core of the topic, like the definition of happiness. Um, in your very famous um, production, in your wonderful podcast that I follow, uh, you put together uh, lab and happiness. Can we say that happiness uh, is a sort of laboratory which is constantly evolving? Yeah, I think we can say that in two ways. One is the science is constantly evolving. I think we, we, we for a long time had insights into the kinds of things that made us happy from good storytellers and philosophers and religious leaders. But I think we didn't really know scientifically whether some of those insights were true. You know, do, do these practices that people think make us happy really make us happy? And so now we have about 30 years of scientific research that's been studying this to find, yeah, there are certain things, certain practices that really make us feel happier and others that don't so much. So I think it's a, it's a laboratory science in the way that all sciences are, you know, like physics and chemistry are laboratory sciences. But I think we can also think about the happiness lab for ourselves. You know, so many of these practices that you might hear about in the scientific work on happiness, you could ask the question, what does it feel like if I apply it to myself? What if I try a gratitude list or increase my social connection? What does that do to my personal happiness? And this is something I encourage my students to do, is not just to hear these studies and you know, put these things into practice, but to really try out how it feels for you, to notice, and mindfully pay attention, oh, that felt good or that didn't feel so good. So I think it's a laboratory science generally, but it's also we can have our own private happiness lab too. Yeah, and, and I guess you, you said it before in your speech that you know, it's very important to measure, right? Um, so we saw from your speech that you brought, you know, evidence of correlation between data points and et cetera. But so is really possible, you think, to measure happiness? Yeah, when I first got into this field, I was sort of worried about this too, right? How do we measure something like happiness? There's no happiness like thermometer where you put it, you know, do, 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 you get out the reading. Um, but a great way to measure happiness is really just to ask people. People often know how satisfied they are with their life, what positive emotions they're experiencing. And, and in some ways, asking people is a good measure because that's what we really want to improve. You know, if there was some thermometer that said I was happy, but you asked me, I said, mm, I'm not feeling good, I'm still burnt out and stuff, you'd want to change what you were doing. So if people are saying, oh, I'm feeling happier, then that ends up being a good measure. And we often ask in two ways. We often ask about how people are feeling in their life and how they're feeling with their life. So how people are feeling in their life is the extent to which people are experiencing positive emotion. Are you having joy and awe and laughter and things like that versus negative emotions like feeling angry and anxious? You don't want to get rid of negative emotions, but you want the ratio to be pretty good. That's being happy in your life. Um, but being happy with your life is this idea of how you think your life is going. All things considered, how satisfied are you with your life? And a lot of the project of positive psychology is trying to increase both of those. So you feel good in your life and you think your life is going well. That's very interesting. So talking about measures, um, I saw a conversation between you and Scott Barry Kaufman and the topic was, well, there is potentially a statistical correlation between, you know, devote yourself to some social, you know, matters uh, for instance, you know, inclusivity or sustainability and these kind of things and how these will affect your personal well-being. So maybe you want to share, you know, what you think about the concept that is possible to utilize strategy for your personal and happiness that are starting from getting involved in some of the social matters. Yeah, I think there's two, two ways that there's this connection between 
happiness and doing good in the world, you know, doing good for these big causes, right? One is that when we engage with things that are purposeful, that are meaningful, that we feel like is making an impact that's helping people, those are practices that end up making us feel better. You know, we feel better when we're engaged in meaningful work. And so tackling some of these big problems, even making a, a small difference in a big problem, can wind up making us feel really good, right? We wind up feeling satisfied with our life that we're doing something important. But there's also a reverse connection, which I feel like is more surprising and maybe even more interesting, which is that there's evidence that if you care about social causes, you know, if you want to fix the climate or the economy or whatever, then you, you probably want to focus on your own happiness. It turns out that happier people tend to be more involved in social causes. So people who are experiencing more positive mood are more likely to go to you know, a protest for something they care about. And this, you know, when you think about it, it makes sense of like, oh, if I'm depressed and sad, I, I won't have the bandwidth to work on this. But what that means is that if you really care about fixing causes in the world, then you also need to focus on your happiness. That you, you know, in the, the airplane phrase, you need to put your own oxygen mask on first yeah. before worrying about these big problems. The research really shows that, that we need to do that. And so I think there's this, there's this dual connection where working on these problems will make us feel happier, but we won't be able to do that well unless we're focused on our own mental health first. Well, I, you know, from my limited, you know, observatory and, and, and the things I do every day, I, I definitely can offer you, the, the, you know, an empirical evidence, right? Mm -hmm. that, that you cannot, for instance, be a good leader, a good manager, if you don't understand yourself, you're not working with yourself, and you're not the best version of yourself because there is no way you can help each other. So that's, uh, yeah, also my experience. So listen, um, among all the different subjects, um, I am particular that you are, you know, uh, proposing. I am particularly fond about this relationship between, you know, positive psychology and 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 antique literature and the classics. Okay, so in one of your podcasts on happiness, uh, the Happiness Lab, of course, um, you you dedicate a lot of very nice episodes about the classics, and I have, you know, um, a sweet spot for two. Um, you call it uh, characters uh, of uh, Homer, which is uh, in Italian, Achille mm -hmm. and Ettore. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe briefly, what do you think are the lessons that we can learn from uh, these two characters? Yeah, well, I think, you know, the cl classic literature is so good at telling stories that get to the heart of human nature, that get to the heart of human happiness. So I think it only makes sense to look back to the great ancient texts to figure this out. Um, you know, and I'm a, a Greek scholar, really interested in, you know, Homer and things. And so I think, you know, the character of Achilles is, is like many Greek heroes, a sort of cautionary tale, right? If you know the story of Achilles, he, in the Iliad at least, he's not really able to go fight because he's kind of really upset. You know, his, his war pride was taken away. He feels like his feelings have been hurt. Um, he's kind of, was kind of treated unfairly, but he's really angry. And in not regulating that anger and not dealing with it, he winds up you know, hurting his men, you know, hurting his homeland, hurting the Greeks, and really not achieving his own glory. And so I think he's a really nice cautionary tale about the fact that if we don't regulate our emotions, we can wind up hurting ourselves. We often think of anger, for example, as hurting other people, but it can wind up hurting us as much more. I think Hector is an interesting test case, you know, less a cautionary tale, but, but also you know, an interesting one of you know, how you can fulfill your duty over time, right? You know, knowing that there are things that you can do that give you a connection to the next generation that are meaningful, even if they're really hard. Uh, for those that don't know, Hector is the character where you know, he's, he's the main Trojan warrior. He kind of knows that they're going to get beat up and slaughtered by the Greeks and that, that you know, Achilles is going to get him. But he talks to his family and says, you know, this is a meaningful, important thing that we're going to do and we need to do it anyway. So he's a great way to think about how you can be happy even when the circumstances are tricky and when the work is really hard. Yeah, wonderful, fantastic. Um, <clears throat> It's probably, you know, we shared during my speech, I learned in my professional experience that sometimes we're asking ourselves the wrong questions, you know. Um, and, um, you know, there is a concept, uh, well, that I learned from the classes that say, well, maybe you need to listen to your inner Socrates, you know, a little bit more. Um, but it's not always easy, right? So maybe you want to share with us one 
simple example of a strategy on how to tap into the area that are more meaningful for you and probably tune down the, the negative questions that might arise in your mind. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it's hard to know ourselves, right? And I think it's even harder in the modern day to know ourselves. It, it's tough as a human to know yourself generally, but in the modern day, we just have so many distractions, right? It's hard to feel like what we feel like in our bodies. We have so many value systems that are tied up in our work about how we should keep pushing ourselves even when we're tired and burnt out and so on. I know this is something you talked about in your speech here today, right? So it can be just really hard to notice when we need rest, when we need help and things like that. And so I think the, the first act and one of the most powerful actions is noticing non-judgmentally. It's to say, I'm tired, like I am not performing well, I need to take a break. Or I'm experiencing anxiety, you know, it might not be the thing I want to experience or the thing that's socially acceptable to experience, but this is what I'm experiencing and I need to notice it. I think this act of taking time to mindfully notice what's happening with your emotions, what's happening in your physical body, in some ways it should be easy, but it's a thing in the modern world that can be really hard. But that act of noticing means you're taking a first step to start acting on some of these things so you can make changes to feel better. Thank you, that's wonderful. You know, talking about strategies, um, you're very famous for these you know, wonderful, wonderful classes, Psychology and Good Life. Um, well, let's celebrate that, the most popular in the whole history of, of Yale University, which is quite remarkable. Congratulations again. Um, what's even more remarkable is that you had like four million people when you put it on the web. Attending that one it is kind of scary. So I'm curious to ask this question, how these experience impacted your you know, life and your perception, your happiness, actually. Yeah, I mean, you know, they've completely changed my, I would not be here in Lake Cuomo in this beautiful room if I had not taught that class. But I think, it, you know, it's impacted me personally in two ways. One is it's, it's given me this important, meaningful quest to kind of share this stuff. The fact that four million people signed up online to take the class just shows me how important the science is, how important teaching the science is. You know, it's really changed to be my life mission to talk about this. Um, but secondly, it's, it's sort of changed me personally because you know, if I'm the professor that's up there in front of four million people, I have to practice what I preach. You know, I can't be saying these things and not doing them myself. And so I think it's really been a way for me to put these strategies and all this good advice into practice and to know that it's important for me to do it too. Um, and that's been really helpful, you know, since I've taught the class my own measures of happiness, you know, I measure how I'm feeling in my life and with my life, and then all of those measures have gone up since teaching the class. Um, and, and that's been important. But but it's it's been not just because of the class, but because I'm but because I'm really putting these things into practice over time. That's ethos, no? That's ethos, yeah. <laughs> So I guess last question is something that you know fascinated me. I mean, you studied for a long time decisional processes, right? How the mind is coming up with the final decision. And, and I think <clears throat> you, you prove with your studies that you know, we believe that humans, we are superior, a lot of species, including you know, monkeys. Mm -hmm. uh, but actually, you know, in terms of the mistakes that you make in, uh, in these you know, choices, we're not that different, right? We, we commit systematic mistakes more or less like monkeys. So I guess the question is, there is something that you know, will bring us happiness if we're able to shift away from this anthropophic centric you know, culture that we have and imagine that you know, although they cannot speak, but other species you know, can offer a lesson to us. Yeah, I mean, you know, one of the big lessons we saw is that you know, we're not you know, as rational, as perfect as we thought, you know, some of the real biases that we see in humans, we see in monkeys and other animals as well. And I think that first makes us humble, right, to realize that, you know, we are more similar to our close ancestors than we thought. But also I think it, it, it causes us to ask the questions of some of the things we think are really important for humans that make us so special. Maybe they're not so special and maybe they're not so good for our happiness. You know, take, take this big brain that we have that can be thinking about a million things and planning and thinking about the future. There's lots of evidence that that kind of contributes to things like anxiety and rumination and, you know, thinking too much, not getting sleep, you know, not socially connecting, right? And so I think, you know, as we think more about our connection with primates, sometimes we have to be humble and think maybe 
we should go back to more as some of the primate ways. Um, in uh, meditation circles, people often talk about the, the monkey mind. You know, so when you're trying to meditate and focus on your thoughts, people will say, oh, your monkey mind is running around and swinging from the trees. But I actually think if you look at real monkeys, like they don't have a monkey mind. They're just more, you know, they're eating, they're focused on eating. They're, you know, socializing, grooming, they're focused on socializing. So I think there's a lot we can learn from the monkey mind and just from primate work in general. That's fantastic. Let me ask you the very last question. When is the last time that you were very happy? Well, I think I'm happy in this room. <laughs> Being in Cuomo is happy. I think it's such a magical place. But yeah, I mean, there's so many spaces where I get happy. And I think it, it reminds me that it's the little things. You know, it's, it's noticing the beauty that's out there that you missed in a new place, but in a place that's familiar. Um, it's really connecting with the people you care about, you know, whether it's my husband or a new person that I'm talking to at a conference like this. You know, so many happy moments are moments that are tiny and you need to be mindful and notice them. Well, I can tell you this interview made me very happy. Thank you, <laughs> Ditto. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much.